have you noticed the changes? I mean, it changes your access to people in the industry and I think the world. Um, I have been a, an, a working actor. I called myself a blue collar actor for many, many years. I was doing commercials, I was hosting, I was doing guest spots and gigs and like everybody else. And I think that when the show took off, people were always like, did your phone start ringing? Did people start offering you things? No, no one has offered me That's anything. That's not the case. No. <laughs> But I started making tapes in my kitchen. And I was doing self tapes, and and I I think what happened is people started watching my tapes. So the next job that I got after flight attendant was Roar with Issa Rae, Nicole Kidman. Yeah, and Nicole Kidman. So like that was, and I knew I had started to hear um, Issa watch the show, and she loved the show. So I knew people had watched my tape, and then I got a movie with Reese Witherspoon. It, like it started to be like I auditioned. <laughs> but you know, like, but it started to be, it started to be like, I think people, when I would show up to the, the set to shoot something else, they would say, I, I've seen you on the show. So that was probably the biggest notice. No one recognized it. We were in our masks. It wasn't like I, I couldn't go to the grocery store, you guys. Like, we could go everywhere. No one knew who we were. Nobody cared. We were just, you know. So it wasn't like that, but it was more. Access. Well, thanks to your character, Shane Evans, Cassie is now a CIA asset. <laughs> and uh, during season one, you were a flight attendant that slowly started revealing yourself. And in the season finale, we find out that you're a CIA agent. Um, where do we find Shane Evans in season two? And what are you exploring with your character now? Uh, season two... I think because the world stopped and because the conversations that happened when the world stopped about black and brown people, about the LGBTQ plus community, I think on season two, first of all, I think everyone grew up. Like I, I look at our show and I'm like, we all look different. I think everybody like grew up. Um, and then I think the conversation inside of the show grew up. Mm -hmm. So. For me, we were now we're dealing with sobriety and we're dealing with, I, I kept feeling like this season was about Shane taking his place in the world. And I think that happened for me internally, right? Like 2020 was about me taking my place in the world. Um, and so I showed up to set like, it's time for me to take my place in the world. Mm. So I, I hope it's on the screen this season. And I think that there were, for me, I want it to feel like the story was not just going to be about Cassie, even though, of course, you know, it, it, the, the show centers around her. But I wanted it to feel like when Shane shows up, that Shane is like, no, 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 it ain't about you. Right. Okay, I have a whole life, I have a whole thing that I'm doing, <laughs> and you can't get in my way. That's 2020 on screen, I think. Right. And that's just the energy shift that I showed up to work with. And quite honestly, our cast showed up to work with that. So it wasn't just me, I think there's allies inside of it that are like, I think it's time for Griffin to say something here today. And it wasn't just me, I think there's a lot of new conversations on the screen. So in season one, as Shane Evans, we find him as a flight attendant, there's a lot of comic relief, uh, plentiful of comic relief. But then, you stop being a flight attendant and all of a sudden you're a CIA agent, you know, killing bad guys. Um, how do you find the comedy inside a s more serious role when we're used to seeing you uh, with the jokes, with the humor, and all of a sudden things have to change? How did you manage the balance between trying to keep some sort of the light humor of Shane Evans but also embrace this more, this growth, this more serious aspect to him. Well, first of all, when I started reading the scripts for season two, I was horrified because there, I didn't see the comedy that was so evident right. in season one for me. Mm -hmm. And they're really great on my show. They let me say things. They're like, Griffin, say whatever you want. And then I just say whatever I want. <laughs> Kaylee says whatever she wants. And we just like, you know, the writing is there and we say what's on the page. And then they're like, now do a take and say whatever you want. So improv. Yeah, it's, we're improv at times, but, um, for me, I think, what, I try to get into the drama of it. Like, Golden Girls is my favorite show. And one of the rules of comedy is they, they're not in a comedy, they're in a drama. 
Blanche is in a drama. She's not in a comedy. So I was just like, right, we have to stay in the drama. And of course, life is funny at times. Right. And so anytime I could find, and Kaylee and I talked about it all the time, anytime we could find a place to inject comedy, we'd do it. But it, tried, it had to be rooted in the drama. And so I kept saying, I feel like I'm on Law & Order. Like, all of a sudden, I'm Mariska. <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm just coming in with my badge. Right, you know? right. And I was like, okay, I got to figure out. I, I have to remember that I am a different representation of a CIA agent. Mm, okay. So I felt a responsibility to, like, stay me inside of it, you know, to, like, bring a different version of CIA. I, I hope I got it. I think you got it. Uh, how would you describe your relationship with Cassie this season? Because a lot of season one, from what I remember, there was this concern from you to Cassie. Like, anything that she did, there was this sense of protection, like you were her savior. And clearly, we now know at the end why you were her savior, but you were, you were really looking for Megan in season one. She happened to be like a secondary focus for you. Where do we find that relationship? Are you guys closer friends now? Uh, or are you trying to be a little bit more distant because Cassie's a little bit of a chaos? Yeah. What's funny is we had so many conversations about this. There, there was a couple. First of all, our writers are brilliant. Um, and they, there was like a line in season two where it was like, Cassie, are you okay? <laughs> and I was like, am I a CIA agent? Don't I know things? <laughs> this lady is not okay. Like, we know she's not okay. He cannot ask yeah. her if she's okay. So Kaylee and I were like, yeah, you can't say that. We have to say something else. And, and so really, like, dealing with sobriety, I've had friends who have been through sobriety, and, and it is so tough. And so one of the things that I've learned from being watching my friends struggle with their sobriety is there's Al-Anon, right? That's the family and friends. Like, you gotta go to therapy too. And I was like, there is boundaries that, that cannot be crossed. And so Shane and Cassie are inside of that tug of war about the boundaries that will not be crossed because Cassie starts to bleed. Her mess starts to bleed into Shane's life. And I think there was a lot of conversations behind the scenes and we tried to get it on the screen about boundaries. Like, you will not destroy my life. You will not destroy my career. And I hope it's okay for me to say this, but I also think that that's 2020. Like, I just think that, like, it was apparent to me that there were boundaries, and I had to hold that line. Like, you don't get to center yourself here. Mm -hmm. So, that was always underneath. Uh, now, did you have choices. to extract that, or did a director kind of give you a sense of guidance of where the character needed to be? Well, sure. We had Silver, our, she's our producing director, so she she shot a lot. A lot of times on TV, you get new directors for every episode. We had Silver Tree. She's incredible, and she was like, she shot several episodes. So we started to, she has opinions. You can go to Silver and say, what do we want to do about this? And also, Kaylee, I'm working with my boss, who's the executive producer. So Kaylee and I could have conversations about it. And so that's why I say it felt like it had to be a group decision. And, and so... Yeah, I mean, I, it was some Rosie and I on the side, we talk it all the time, you know, about who we are in this world. And so there was a lot of conversations that I think were welcomed um, under the given circumstances of the world, you know. So, yeah, it was, it was discussed, for sure. Now, a lot of um, actors today have had to adjust to filming these incredible landscapes with green screen backgrounds. That's not the case <laughs> in the flight attendant. You guys actually shoot in real locations, in this case, Iceland, Berlin, uh, especially. It feels like James Bond, you know, like a uh, uh, type of production. What does it mean for you as an actor to not have Iceland as a green screen background and actually be there in the real location? What advantages or benefits does that offer for you as an actor? And, and I guess for Shane. Yeah, first of all, it's incredible to travel the world under HBO and Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different way to travel, ladies and gentlemen. So I, I got to experience that. But, you know, I will, say, I will say that Iceland changed my life. Iceland changed yeah. my life. Oh, yeah. I didn't want to go to Iceland. No black person wants to go to Iceland in December. In the, the dead of December, no black person wants to show up to Iceland on December 15th. We're not trying to go there. 
Um, funny enough, Kaylee and I were like, we were in a group text talking about like, what? Who picked Iceland? Like, we were so not wanting to go there. P.S. Iceland is four hours of daylight in December. So we were like, so we're leaving LA to go in the dark tundra where it's freezing and like we didn't want to go. We got on the ground in Iceland. It's incredible. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. The people are tall Vikings and they're white and there's not a black person for miles, but it's really quite incredible. Um, but one of the things that changed my life about shooting in Iceland, and we also shot in, as I said, Bangkok last season, Rome, is after 2020, I get to Iceland my first night. I was like, I'm going to go meet someone for a drink. It's like 10 o'clock. Um, and I go to the front desk and I say, um, is it safe for me to go down this street? I'm going here. And, and this lady looked at me like, what, what do you mean is it safe? I said, well, because it's dark and it's been dark since three. Is it safe? And she was like, it's safe. Like, no one's going to hurt you. And that is like, if you're American and if you're a brown right. person in this country, you need to know the world is not all operating the way we are operating over here. It is safe. You can walk down the street in Iceland. No one's going to hurt you. <laughs> so that actually, so as our, our crew is Icelandic and it, and I made friends there, it started a conversation about like who we are in the world. Mm. Like if you have never left the United States, you better go. Mm. You better find out what it feels like to be somewhere where there isn't that history, where you are American and you are not black American or African American or the descendants of slaves. I have nothing wrong with that. I'm proud of it. But it is a different experience to go somewhere where they're just like, you're American. And we like Americans. Mm -hmm. And you can walk down the street, no one's gonna shoot you. Which was my question, is someone gonna hurt me? You know, so I, anyways, that inside of this job, inside of this experience is incredible. It's life changing. It makes you feel like a citizen of the world. And it also makes you feel like we have a responsibility to solve those issues in our country. It's like the conversation from 2020 continues. Speaking of, right before we got on stage, uh, you and I had a brief conversation, and you mentioned that this whole experience for you uh, was a hunt for diversity. And looking at diversity today and the way a film and television have adjusted uh, post Floyd, um, how do you think Shane Evans and your character and Rosie's character? Uh, in the show, how well do you think this contributes to the TV landscape, and how does it contribute overall to society? Well, the first thing is that I'm a black, gay, skinny CIA agent <laughs> <laughs> with like a dreadlock mullet. <laughs> like I think it counts in the canon of TV. I didn't see anybody like me when I was growing up. And I certainly didn't see them in a position of authority. My, the early part of my career was a lot of sassy secretary and sassy best friend. And so to have a position on a TV show on HBO Max is, um, I mean, it's life changing for me. And I hope that it impacts the way that we see ourselves on screen. I know Rosie would say something very similar, although she's had a pretty incredible career. Um, but Rosie also sat me down in Rome in our trailer and she read me for filth in that trailer about my responsibility inside of this show. What did she say? Well, I had a question. So we shoot out of order. We shoot out of order and we were shooting the finale, season one, when I come to the door, boom, boom. We were shooting that in episode four position. So I had not read the rest of the show. We were in Rome and they were like, yeah, you gotta be a CIA agent. And I was like, what? And so I had all these questions, and I was like, well, I don't want to ask me this, like, weird, so I don't want to say anything. And she was like, if you don't get in there and ask, they will do whatever they want. You, you are part of this conversation. You have to bring yourself and your life. And, da, da, da. and it was like, you know, like, people of color, we are, t we just be grateful for your job, and thank you very much. <laughs> and Rosie was like, no, no, you have to contribute. If there's an issue, you have to say, I have an issue with this. What does that line mean? I don't feel like we would say it like that. We have to say it like that. All of that stuff. Rosie read me, and she was right about everything, and I took some of my thoughts to the producers, and they were like, yes, good idea, which I didn't know that they would do. That is the, the brilliance of my experience of HBO Max. It's also the brilliance of having women in power. I have to say it because, like, it changes, and it changed the landscape to have Kaylee and, and Natalie and everybody, like, it's, it changes silver, it changes the landscape. I had a baby in the pandemic. Congratulations. 
I had a baby on Monday. They called me on Tuesday and said you have to be in New York on Friday. Wow. And I said I had a baby. <laughs> and they were like, well, then you can't come to New York. We're going to write you out of the episode and you're going to take paternity leave. It ne That's women. Two, two mothers at the top. And they're like, you can't come. We're going to write you out of the episodes. Because that was when you had to come to New York for two weeks in quarantine and da da da. And it was cr I was going to be gone for two months from my newborn. And they were like, you can't do that, Griff. So, anyways, I say all that to say that the, the, it's not just about the representation for me. I think it's also about what happens behind the scenes. It's not enough to put black and brown people on screen. It has to be happening behind the scenes. It's not enough to put women in front. They have to be behind. It changes everything. This event, I don't know if this event would be happening if we hadn't done 2020. I don't know if I would be here or you would be here. I don't know. But I'm grateful for the network for caring about it. Um, a black woman is running Warner Brothers, by the way. That happened in the pandemic. Channing, running Warner Brothers. It's a gag. It is a gag. She looks like my aunt. You're like, okay, hello. You're running things. I'm loving that. But that is that is companies putting their their money where their mouth is and really I mean you see you see the characters on our show this season, Margaret and Rosie's relationship, even the LGBTQ storylines, like they don't really go much more than like, we like to dance together. But I kinda love it because isn't that what life is? You don't get the whole story. They do what they gotta do. So anyways, I think those kinds of things, our show reflects the growth of our culture and I, I'm really proud of that. We're, we're very proud of it too. Uh, before we uh, finish here, uh, let's take a couple of questions. So where do we begin? Thank you, Aaron. All right, let's start with you in the first question. Yeah, my name is Shana. I'm with The Nocturnal. I wanted to know how have you grown as an actor since working on this show? First of all, another pair of thigh highs. <laughs> that was the dress code this evening. Um, I've become more confident. I trust myself more. I think it's due to my cast and the crew really like allowing me to talk like myself. I've never had to butch up. I've never had to, you know, <laughs> be anything other than myself, bring myself. So that changes your life as an actor when you realize like you're enough. Um, so that, I just trust myself more and I and I am not afraid to get involved in the conversation about what story we're telling. I was very afraid before to lose my job or to say the wrong thing. And I really do feel like I can ask, I can challenge, and I can make decisions inside of the creative process that I didn't think I could before. Did this show in particular reinforce that confidence yes. for you? Yes, 100%. First of all, my co-stars, Kaylee is incredible to work with. She is bananas. She's so talented. So we like feed off of each other. The things that we say to each other, like that's our lives on screen. That's how we talk to each other. And same for Rosie and like all, we are, strangely enough, friends. We really are friends behind the scenes and it changes what happens when they yell action. So so that's part of the confidence. So yes, I think the show has been a direct result of, of that. All right, let's have another question. Hi, Delana Dixon of DivaGalsDaily.com. Two yes. questions. One, how would you like to see your character's personal life play out on screen? And since you talked about fashion in New York City, tell us about your fabulous fashion, because you look incredible tonight. You're my favorite person on the screen. <laughs> I love you so much. Uh, the f okay, I literally, I blanked on the first question, because as you were to, I'm beads of sweat. I'm your like, character's so, personal okay, life. My like to yes, oh right, my personal life. Well, yeah, that thing that you said. Uh, my character's personal life. I watched, I was working on this project, um, I watched this documentary about fame. And I was watching Debbie Allen talk about fame. And she, it, De, get into Debbie Allen. She is a priestess, a high priestess. Debbie Allen said when they were working on fame, she was like, Chad, I know I was gonna get nominated for everything, but I knew I couldn't win. Because those other ladies, they went home with those other ladies. They would not go home with me though. They would not go home with me. So you can't win if they don't go home. 
And I like, that has never left my brain. So where I would love for my character to go, and we talked so much about this on season two, is I would love to go home with Shane. Mm. I would love to see what is really Shane. You'll see some of, of, of it in the next couple episodes coming, but I would really, you know, the idea of playing CIA, they were like, people, friends and family don't know that you're in the CIA. Is that his real apartment? Is that his real clothes? Like, you don't know how far the gig is going, you know? So I would just really love to go home with Shane. And I really want Issa Rae to play my sister. <laughs> Issa and I talked about it on set. I was like, you gonna play my sister? Yes, yeah, she was like, I'm gonna play your sister. <laughs> Tell him to call me. So I wanna go home with Shane. I want, to, I want to see the, the full extent of who he is when the doors are closed. Um, fashion. Um, I do my own fashion. I don't have a stylist. There is no muse. There is no someone that inspires your sense of taste. Sure. I mean, I'm inspired by every. I mean, I'm inspired by you. Like I'm looking at. I'm like, okay, we match. Like I just, we just get inspired. Um, but of course, I have. Uh, one of the things is that you, I just want to get closer to what I wanted. We're just wearing whatever we want. I just feel like we've survived. We are black. We are. Get, we just wear whatever we want. So when I go and look for clothes, I literally just go. If I think it's pretty, I just buy it. I just put it. I just believe it's for me. You know, it's like the Lord sent me this, and I'm gonna put it. In. So like, I bought this in Iceland. At like a vintage, I think everything I'm wearing is pretty much vintage, but yeah, I just try to like, I just try to be myself. The journey of an actor, I think, is getting closer to yourself, not getting farther. The ones who get farther, we see them. The ones who get closer, I think Meryl got closer, mm -hmm. because if you're closer to yourself, it's on the screen. I think Kaylee got closer to herself this season. So I can see that. Yeah. You can see it. So I just try to be close to myself. Let's ask another question. 